Uh, thank you, Charles. And thank you all for being here. Uh, this uh, uh, presentation that I'm going to be giving is based on uh, joint work that I've uh, uh, done with uh, Jun Kyung Ah, JK, who is our uh, PhD student who is going to be in the market uh, this year. So after the presentation is over, uh, JK and I will be happy to take uh, any questions that you may have uh, on uh, the paper. And uh, I'm going to follow Paul's uh, uh, you know, style in the sense that I'm not going to present any of the uh, uh, details of the model. I'm going to let you take a look at uh, the paper itself, should you have an interest. But I'm going to try and convey uh, the economic intuition uh, behind what we are doing. Uh, just before I get into my topic, I just want to say a couple of things about Paul's presentation, which uh, I enjoyed a lot. Uh, you know, uh, as Paul pointed out, both Reserve Bank of India as well as People's Bank of uh, China uh, have taken a very active position in increasing the reserves. For example, uh, if commercial banks tended to lend more to real estate in tier one cities like Shanghai in China, Bombay in India, they promptly increased the risk weights and increased the reserves. And in the United States, a consequence of increasing the risk weight in corporate bonds, for example, has caused the US uh, government bond dealers to dramatically reduce their inventory holding, uh, uh, drastically affecting the liquidity of the corporate bond market. So sometimes you can have uh, you know, unexpected outcome uh, as well. OK, so before I sort of uh, go into uh, a summary of my paper with JK, I just want to give you the big picture. Uh, what are the main uh, takeaways and themes? Uh, some of this is not uh, a consequence of our paper. This is general stylized fact. And some are consequences of uh, our paper. So financial firms use significantly more levels of short-term debt compared to non-financial firms. A very big part of uh, the short-term debt uh, that is used by uh, the financial firms are exempt from automatic stay. And this is where the creditor rights, which is the main title for my talk, uh, kicks in. What's the meaning of uh, exemption from automatic stay? It simply means that if you are a money market mutual fund, and let's say that I'm JP Morgan, and you're lending me cash, and I'm giving you collateral, that collateral is not covered by automatic stay. So if I were to fail, you walk free with that collateral. Okay, that is extensive, you know, super priority rights that are given to the cash lenders in the repo market. So uh, I'm going to show you, when you look at the liability structure, of financial firms, they do use a lot of these, okay? And uh, when you borrow uh, on the basis of the super priority right, uh, you see the third bullet point, uh, that borrowing exposes the financial firms to the possibility that the money market mutual fund at some point may not like my balance sheet, they may just walk free with the collateral and they may not renew the loan, right? That is called the run risk associated with this borrowing. So the question, uh, that then arises is why would you, as a borrower, want to engage in this activity? What is it about this activity that may be optimal? And this is what JK and I uh, studied in our paper. And we go a step further and ask, if you have the choice of uh, issuing debt with exemption from automatic stay, which subjects you to run risk, as well as uh, issuing uh, long-term debt, uh, how would you go about uh, picking this mixture, okay? Would there be an optimal mix of these two liabilities? And that cuts to the issue of uh, optimal liability structure, inherently also optimal priority structure, because one has much higher uh, creditor rights compared to the other. Okay, so just a couple of pictures, okay? Uh, actually, Jake and I had to pull together data from Capital IQ, CompuStat, and a whole bunch of other uh, sources to give you this picture. So all the green shadings that you're seeing are all short-term debt. All the blue uh, that you're seeing are long-term debt, right? So along the y-axis, uh, on the left-hand side, you have the percentage. Uh, and along the uh, right y-axis, it gives you uh, some information about the composition of uh, the short-term and long-term debt. And what I want to focus on, notice that the short-term debt for financial firm is quite significant, anywhere from 
40 uh, percent to you know 35 percent. Right, it's a pretty uh, big number, and uh, a good chunk of that uh, is things like repo, asset-backed commercial paper, which are uh, you know uh, categories of debt where uh, you are exempt from automatic stay. In other words, creditor gets super priority rights. Okay. Now you can imagine if you're lending long term to financial firms and you are cognizant of the fact that uh, the firm has uh, sequestered a whole bunch of collateral uh, under the super priority right, you're going to be concerned about that because in the event of a bankruptcy, these assets are not going to be available to you and ex ante, you're going to demand uh, a spread, right, in order to be willing to lend. And this is a trade-off that we study uh, in our paper. Okay, how about uh, non-financial firms? You can see that the green shading uh, is quite negligible here. So on, on average, uh, non-financial firms have less of a run risk, right? They use much less of short-term debt. They tend to use a lot more of long-term debt. Okay, now I want to give a few illustrations uh, of what I mean by the run risk. And in this uh, uh, slide you're seeing, uh, what happened to uh, the Lehman's repo book, right? And this is out of a study that was done uh, at the New York uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, and what you can see here is that one week prior to the filing date of the bankruptcy, uh, the repo lenders start to walk away with their collateral, right? It doesn't matter what collateral is used, whether it is U.S. Treasury, agency, mortgage-backed securities, uh, you know, or whatever be the collateral, they were simply walking away from Lehman, right, uh, running with that collateral. Likewise, if you had looked at Bear Stearns uh, a few days prior to uh, its acquisition, a uh, forced acquisition, uh, it had a very similar problem with this repo lender. And part of the problem was, of course, both uh, Lehman Brothers as well as uh, Bear Stearns were relying a great deal on mortgage collateral. Okay, and the crisis was obviously mortgage related. This is asset-backed commercial paper. At the height, uh, just prior to the crisis, a trillion dollars, very quickly, uh, the lenders walked away uh, from this market. Uh, primary dealers, repo financing also fell, but the Federal Reserve stepped in, set up a, a special facility to uh, essentially provide uh, lending to primary dealers, so you see that it sort of uh, stabilized at a much higher level. This suggests that in a crisis, central banks could intervene and provide a backstop, right? We shouldn't be uh, you know, uh, not cognizant of that, and this gives you a similar situation for uh, commercial paper and repo. Now I want to give a little bit of a historical uh, background about exemption from automatic stay and how did it come about, right? Uh, so uh, to understand this, we need to actually go back to the 1980s. So in May 1982, uh, Drysdale government securities uh, failed. Okay, followed uh, in August 1982 by Lombard Vale. And at that time, the chairman uh, of the Federal, uh, Federal Reserve was uh, Paul Volcker. Okay? And uh, he feared that these failures of these primary dealers, uh, of these repo dealers, could be quite problematic for the central bank. Why is that? Central bank is a big player in the repo market, right? That is the mechanism through which they inject or drain liquidity into the capital market, and they were quite concerned that if these dealers were to fail, uh, that could have calamitous consequences for Fed's ability to conduct its open market operations, right? Now, part of the difficulty was that repo uh, cash lenders were not sure about the status of the collateral, whether the collateral uh, belonged to them or in the event of these bankruptcies, uh, whether they couldn't have access to the collateral. And to confuse matters, the bankruptcy court, which was overseeing these two insolvencies, uh, basically sided uh, with the borrowers and did not allow the cash lenders to seize the collateral. Okay, so at that time, we didn't have this exemption from automatic stay. So what was, uh, you know, uh, what happened was Paul Volcker successfully lobbied the Congress and said, well, uh, these uh, repo collateral uh, should be made exempt from automatic stay. Uh, if that were not to happen, it would have calamitous consequences on Fed's ability to uh, perform its open market operations. And that led to the Bankruptcy Amendments and Federal Judgeship Act of 1984. 
Okay, so it, I, I sort of quote uh, from Paul Volcker's uh, presentation uh, at the Congress where he was very persuasive uh, in arguing that this exemption has to be given uh, for this collateral, but he was very, very cautious. He said, uh, you know, the legislation has to be done in a fairly narrow manner and should only be applicable to U.S. government and agency, agency securities, right? He was not uh, going to suggest that all uh, repo transactions, including illiquid mortgages, should be exempt from automatic stay. But unfortunately, in 2005, uh, the Bankruptcy Abuse and Prevention and Consumer Protection Act basically extended uh, this exemption to uh, residential mortgage-backed, security-backed uh, repo transactions as well. And subsequently, of course, the mortgage crisis came, and a lot of the repo transactions that Lehman and uh, you know, uh, Bear Stearns did were based on mortgage-backed repo transactions. So you can see that uh, this was not a particularly a good move uh, ex post, right? Okay, so this gives you a sort of picture really what is going on. So you can see that, uh, you know, between 81 uh, and these two dashed vertical lines refer to those two bankruptcies that I spoke about, Drysdale and Lombard Wheel. Up until that time, uh, you know, dealers were operating on the belief that their collateral belonged to them when they lent cash. Uh, but then the ruling came uh, against that assumption and then, you know, dramatic drop uh, in, uh, you know, repo cash lending. Uh, until uh, Paul Volcker successfully lobbied the Congress to pass this law, and you can see that there is a, a pickup, a dramatic pickup uh, in uh, uh, repo cash lending. So, uh, what is uh, uh, the intellectual uh, issue here? The intellectual issue here is that why do you want to give these uh, rights to the creditor, super priority rights to the creditors? And what J.K. and I try to argue in our paper is to say, if the bankruptcy code within which uh, you are operating is very inefficient, your ability to borrow is going to be limited, right? If you're a potential lender and you look at the bankruptcy code, you say it's messy, it's going to impose a lot of dead weight losses, it's going to take months to resolve anything, I wouldn't lend at all, or if I lend, I'm going to be lending at a very unattractive price. So there is value then in saying, well, I'm operating in a very inefficient bankruptcy code, so I should sequester some of the collateral, give some super priority rights, and that's going to improve my debt capacity, right? That's going to increase my tax shield, so you can readily see that there are some advantages associated with this exemption from automatic stay. Despite the fact that that's going to subject you to run risk, right? So what's the tension here? The tension is that code can lead to dead weight loss, Court can violate absolute priority rights, right? Uh, that's not good for the creditors, right? If the junior, uh, you know, uh, uh, creditors and you know equity holders get something in bankruptcy, even seniors don't get their full share. That's a violation of absolute priority right. But if I give the, gave the collateral to you and gave you exemption from automatic stay, this is not going to happen to you. So you can see that uh, staying inside the court have uh, may have present some difficulties to the lender that may limit your ability to issue debt. Going outside the code is going to expand your ability to borrow, but on the other hand, it has its own cost, right? What are the costs? They can run with the collateral, and that can present a uh, you know, cost to you. Not only that, other lenders who are operating inside the code are going to say, well, you're moving some other collateral, carving it out, putting it outside, that's not going to be available to us, so we're going to increase the spread at which we are prepared to lend to you. And what JK and I do is to construct a model where we uh, you know, formally model this trade-off and show that in general, if you're a financial company, you would choose a little bit of both, right? There'll be an interior uh, optimal liability structure that you would choose. So that's the main, uh, that's the main insight uh, of this paper, okay? So let me uh, skip this and talk a little bit about intuitively how we think about default, right? So if you're going to be operating within automatic stay, you're not thinking about issuing uh, super priority uh, collateral exempt from automatic stay. How do you think about it? You as a borrower can pay the contractual coupon and run the firm. Equity value is going to be positive. E refers to equity value. Or you at some point are going to say, well, I'm not going to make the contractual coupon. Uh, I'm going to file for bankruptcy. 
And eventually, the theory basically says that you're going to only do that when your equity value goes to zero. In other words, you're going to find what is the optimal default point. Uh, you're going to keep running down the value of the equity until eventually the equity goes to zero because you have that bias, right? As long as you, are, you have a call option, right? As equity holder has a call option, and then talked about the importance of options pricing theory, this is going to show up in just about every uh, you know, uh, aspect of your uh, career. And you know, that options pricing theory was used by Bob Merton to suggest that optimal way for you to decide on the default decision and maximize the equity value is to run the firm until equity value is driven to zero. How would this uh, be modified when you have this uh, both types of debt, right? When you have this uh, uh, debt inside the automatic stay and outside with super priority, right? Well, what you're going to do is that you have a, a choice, right? You can always ask, what is my optimal default decision, right? In the absence of this uh, super priority debt, then what I could do is essentially I can pick the right amount of this repo loan such that the point at which the repo lenders are going to run is precisely when I would have defaulted in the first place. So that uh, the run decision by uh, the repo lenders is not going to constrain your default decision, and that's going to give you an interior liability structure, and JK and I characterize uh, that liability structure uh, in our paper. Okay, so uh, what are some other things, uh, you know, insights that I'm, uh, I'm running out, Charles is commenting that I'm running out. So I'm going to very quickly summarize this for you. Uh, when the code is very costly and when it doesn't protect the rights of the lenders, uh, borrowers will have an incentive to move the collateral out, right? They will issue super priority uh, you know, uh, debt. And if the liquidity of the collateral is not very good, they're not going to do this. This is very consistent with what Paul Volcker was recommending uh, to the Congress at the time the 1982 Exemption Act uh, was passed. Uh, and uh, uh, generally, the inefficiencies of the bankruptcy code, we argue, is the primary reason for the emergence of these types of uh, financing uh, arrangements. So uh, one last point, individual firms may have incentive to set up these uh, kinds of uh, uh, you know, repo lending uh, and take on the run risk, but they're not internalizing the social costs, right? If all kind, if every financial firm were to issue this uh, super priority debt, and simultaneously due to an exogenous shock, all these repo lenders were going to run, as it more or less happened in 2008, that imposes a social cost, right? That social cost is not internalized in this model. Only the private costs are internalized in this model. So why don't I uh, stop there and then We'll take up that question. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.